Welcome or welcome back to Plainness Pages. Today we're talking about Act 4 of Hamlet. This is going to be a very, very long act, so I will have to omit some detail, but this video will contain a full summary and analysis of the act with lots of quotes to help you write whatever exam you're doing. Okay, let's get started. So, uh, Act 4, Scene 1. Claudius remarks that there's matter in these sighs, these profound heaves. He comes in to find the queen greatly distressed. She's crying. She's crying because we, of course, saw that Hamlet murdered Polonius. Heaves refers to heavy sighs and matter as in significance. She's crying for a significant reason. He tells her to explain and asks where her son is, inferring it is because of the meeting with Hamlet that she is crying. Gertrude tells him that she is shocked because of what she has seen. She has realized that Hamlet is mad as the sea and wind when both contend which is the mightier. She keeps her promise to Hamlet that we have seen in Act 3. Check out the video down below or up in the info cards. She keeps her promise and she stresses her madness, telling Claudius that he's as passionate and raging as the sea in a storm, and she also tries to defend Hamlet by excusing him that he's in his lawless fit and in his brainish apprehension has killed a man because he thought that Polonius was a rat. Claudius replies that tis a heavy deed and that Hamlet's liberty is full of threats to all, to you, yourself, to us, to everyone. In other words, Hamlet's freedom is a danger to society, and Claudius asks how this bloody deed be answered. He declares that Hamlet must be kept out of haunt, as in secluded and away from others. They were wrong in keeping Hamlet, so much was our love. Basically, he claims that they loved him so much that they did not notice in time that he was mad or they did not want to admit to themselves that he was mad and so now they must pay the price they must get rid of him so that he doesn't let it feed even on the pith of life basically he says that hamlet is the owner of a foul disease and he's preying on their life and peace and we see another example of madness being seen as an illness as a sickness and it's a fascinating inversion of roles here the fact that he says that it's like a disease because it's usually hamlet throwing out these statements it's hamlet who says your infidelity you sleep on a bed of garbage. Your corruption has caused the decline of our kingdom. Uh, before, Marcellus has said that something is rotten in the state of Denmark. All of this kind of semantic field of sickness, of rot, of corruption has previously referred to Claudius, and now the irony is that Claudius is referring it to Hamlet, not being aware that this is how others perceive him, even though we now know that he's not well-liked. It suggests that there has been a dirtying of Hamlet as well. The fact that he is also now a murderer, just like Claudius, even though he is murdered for different and for more noble reasons, he's tainted now. And it also suggests just how much Clo Hamlet has managed to get into Claudius's head, that Claudius is now not like, he's now taking him seriously. Whereas before he was like, who cares if the son is left behind? He's not a threat. Now he's like, oh yes, Hamlet is most definitely a threat. He needs to be sent away. He now even speaks with phrases that Hamlet would have used. And he asks Gertrude again, where is Hamlet? It's the third time he asked her this. It is clear that Gertrude is stretching for time to allow her son to hide. She has basically admitted to herself that what they're doing is wrong and has sided with Hamlet, even though she doesn't speak of it yet. But she says that she, again, she says that she doesn't know and that he weeps for what is done. Claudius tells her, come away, because of course she's crying in her room, like, let's go. We will ship him hence as soon as possible. We, will, In other words, we'll get rid of him anyway, so stop crying. We'll send him to England. And this vile deed, we must with all our majesty and skill, both countenance and excuse. In other words, as my final favor to your son, I'll use my royal standing and say, oh, well, of course it was an accident. Uh, of course he can't be permitted to live in this kingdom, but he'll be permitted to keep his life and we'll just send him off. So that's a nice and easy solution, right, Gertrude? So stop crying and let's get on with it. Let's go look for him. He tells Rosencrantz and Gilderstein, who come in, to go and look for Hamlet and bring the body into the chapel, explaining that Hamlet has, in madness, killed Polonius. He tells Gertrude that they will go and call on their wisest friends and that his soul is full of discord and dismay. And that's all he expresses about the death of his most beloved advisor. So that tells us a lot about Claudius. He's very, very happy to use people when they're convenient, and when they're gone, he views it as, well, simply that, a minor inconvenience, a matter that's unimportant, because people can be replaced. That is what Claudius thinks. He does certainly does not view Polonius as a friend, and he certainly does not give him more time than that. So this is why 
Hamlet has well told Rosencrantz and Guildenstern that their roles are so insignificant, as we'll see later on. So we see them find Hamlet, and Hamlet refers that remarks that the body is safely stowed. He hears someone calling his name, and Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, and the others rush in, and Rosencrantz asks him what he has done with the body, and Hamlet replies that he has compounded it with dust, where to tis kin. In other words, I buried it somewhere, no one will ever find it, because Polonius is also long dead, long gone. He's like dust. Dust he shall remain in a forgotten corner somewhere. Rosencrantz asks him to show the body so that they can take it to the chapel. Hamlet refuses because this is his trump card. It's his last bargaining power. Hamlet knows perfectly well he's going to be sent off, and he even seems to have formulated a plan. He's happy to be sent off. So here he is pulling his time. They can't do anything to him until they find the body, so he's also... He's also most likely doing it out of petty measures to get back at Polonius a little more, that he is not to be laid in the ground sooner, as is custom. Because, like, of course, if you're laid in the ground sooner, that implies that you're following the correct procedure for a funeral. But if your body is rotting somewhere, and certainly not in the church, and you've been killed in such a way, spying on someone, your passage to heaven is not going to be easy. And I think that Hamlet definitely wants Polonius to experience that because he has seen the, fa the suffering of his father. So Hamlet also remarks that he won't tell anything to Guildenstern or Rosencrantz besides to be demanded of a sponge, what replication should be made by the son of a king. This is what I was referring to previously. He calls Rosencrantz a sponge that soaks up the king's countenance, his rewards, his authorities. When he needs what you have gleaned, it is by squeezing you and sponge you shall be dry again. In other words, you're a sponge because you're blindly obeying the king. You're soaking up all this evil, all this disgusting, dirty water just for the promise of a reward. But if you think that you're gonna get it, you're very much mistaken because you, once you've served your role, he'll squeeze you dry and leave. Look at Polonius. Has he grieved? No, certainly not. So once you've served your role, you'll also be just discarded. It's pretty sound advice, perhaps as like a final gift, bearing in mind that they were at some point friends. Rosencrantz says that he doesn't understand the speech because it does sound like an out of context ramble. Like imagine you're just talking to someone and you're like, hey, you've killed someone, where's the body? And they're like, you're a sponge. It's a little bit of a non sequitur, it doesn't follow, but it is pretty sound advice. The genius in Hamlet's act is that the things he says are, well, they're quite poignant, they're quite cutting, they get to the chase, they're socially relevant, but nobody seems to understand because of his towering intelligence. He's alienated and lonely and mad, partly because of that. Hamlet replies that he is glad of it, well, glad that he doesn't, that Rosencrantz doesn't understand. A knavish speech sleeps in a foolish ear. So a sarcastic remark is wasted upon an unintelligent ear. I mean, he's outwardly told them several times that he's pretending to be mad, he's made jokes at their expense, and they're still too dense to realize it. Too dense is not a direct quote, but just this is what he thinks that they are, that they're too dense. It's another insult for Rosencrantz, of course. We understood this one, Mark. It was clear and out in the open. And to be honest, there's nothing to say that Rosencrantz didn't understand the remark either. He could have just said, I don't understand, for the sake of social convenience and politeness. Hamlet then moves on and says, the body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. The king is a thing of nothing. Bring me to him, hide fox and all after. So this pretty chiasmus this time sounds like he's saying something, but there is no sense. It remains a riddle, perhaps indicative of his act of madness that he's intent on putting on. Him remarking that the king is a thing of nothing could also be referring to the prayer book of Psalms where it says that man is like a thing of naught. It could also just be saying that the king is nothing, just empty air, just a shadow, the illusion of good and a just king. There are layers and layers to unpack in Hamlet's every line, which I think makes Hamlet the the in immensely intelligent tragedy that it is. The fox refers, of course, to the games of foxes and hounds. It puts the captors off their guard. It's essentially saying who's hunting who. It also gives us a little bit of an indication that this is a game to him and he's hunting the king. This is very much a chess match and he's the one moving the pieces this time. It's another slight, of course. It also puts him as the hunter, paints the king as worthless, and they all exit. Act 4, Scene 3. So this scene begins with a monologue where Claudius remarks that he has sent people to find Hamlet and the body and how dangerous it is, is it that this man goes loose. 
Yet they shouldn't put the law on him, so they shouldn't just charge him and throw him into prison because he's scared that Hamlet may be treated less harshly, that no one will care what he has done because the people love Hamlet, they will forgive him his offense. Hamlet was a pretty popular figure in court before the whole situation, and this monologue gives us indication that Claudius is aware of this. Hamlet was friends with the guards, Hamlet is a great swordsman, a lover, he's the people's prince, he's very much the favorite, and Claudius is clearly not willing to risk it because well Claudius is king and he's not very popular and here I am charging a young people's favorites with something what's what's stopping a people's revolt right what's stopping them from backing him and for that reason because he's loved of the distracted multitude they should send him away this will be the safest option the deliberate pause in other words it will seem like a careful and deliberate decision to send him away and Hamlet won't be avenged for and cause trouble for Claudius even later diseases desperate grown by desperate appliance are relieved or not at all in other words, he's saying that Hamlet is the disease. He may get into the minds of the people, get into the minds of the country, and so by plucking Hamlet out, by sending him away, he's preventing the spread of the disease. This is a radical measure that must be implemented. Desperate situations call for desperate measures, in other words. So Rosencrantz comes in at this point, and he says that they can't find out where the body is. But Hamlet's waiting outside to talk to Claudius, and Ham uh, Hamlet and Guildenstern come in. So Hamlet says that Polonius is at supper, not where he eats, but where he's eaten. A certain convocation of politic worms are even at him. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. Hamlet is making a statement that I think could be interpreted in two, in two ways. One is an allusion to the Diet of Worms of 1521, a meeting of the Holy Roman Empire to hear Luther defend his doctrine, but I think the second interpretation is perhaps more so for the more general audience. Basically, what he's saying is essentially that, oh, well, yes, Polonius is at supper, like we would usually expect him to be, and yes, this spiteful tone is how I imagine the actor saying this, but he's in the ground. He's not the one eating, it's the worms eating him. He's food for the worms, he's buried, he's decaying. It's both a witty allusion and also a sharp and rude way to refer to his bloody deed, because of course, that is immensely disrespectful. So he then says, when asked again, well, they just ignore this remark and ask, where is he? Polonius is in heaven. Send thither to see. If your messenger finds him not there, seek him in the other place yourself. So to an outsider who's not paying attention, this is gibberish. First the allusion to worms, then to heaven. It seems like he's mad. But really, what he's saying is that if you want to find him in heaven, send one of your messengers because they're innocent. They believe you're just a king. They're unsuspecting good servants and they'll do the deed and go to heaven. But they won't find him there, maybe. And at that point, go to hell and find him yourself. Go to hell, you're suited for that. Hamlet then casually adds that the body is on the stairs in the lobby, so everybody loses this remark and Claudius ignores it, either because he still has this idea that he wants to follow social convention and be, well, gentle and polite, or because he genuinely doesn't understand. And the messengers leave to go look for the body. So Claudius ignores all this, and he remarks to Hamlet that they, for thine especial safety, must send Hamlet away with fiery quickness. Therefore, prepare thyself. The ship is ready, go prepare yourself for your passage to England. Hamlet is very happy outwardly, and he says, farewell, dear mother. When Claudius asks him, what about me, thy loving father, Hamlet replies that my mother, father and mother is man and wife, man and wife is one flesh, and so is my mother. In other words, you're nothing, you're blur into one, and when you do blur into one, I would prefer my mother countless times over you. It's a final insult to Claudius, who of course is the king, so he should be well, the primary the primary person that people say goodbye to. He should be treated with the status and due respect. And so Hamlet leaves for England and Claudius tells them to tempt him with speed aboard. Make sure he gets on that ship. Everyone leaves but Claudius, leaving him to give us a short monologue. He begs England, if my love thou holds that ought, in other words, if you obey me in, even in the slightest, or since you owe me one because Denmark helped you get your crown, help me by giving me the present death of Hamlet. Do it, England, for like the hectic in my blood he rages, and thou must cure me, till I know tis done, however my haps my joys were never began. 
Whatever happiness Claudius has, he can't be fully content until Hamlet is dead. He is begging England to kill Hamlet, but potentially he's also telling us his plan to get rid of Hamlet there. We also see just how much Hamlet grates on Claudius and how he has been successful in the veiled threats and haunting him. Claudius can now not live calmly and ignore Hamlet knowing that he's after him. This is also a continuation of the play moving towards its climax as now Claudius is very clearly after Hamlet and well to be honest Hamlet has provoked this. <laughs> Act 4 scene 4. You'll notice that Act 4 in general is made out of lots and lots of tiny acts, uh, tiny scenes and very large scenes and it's very choppy in its nature and it's to show just how quickly action moves from here because we'll get to a quote later on that says this about that says that grief doesn't come at one uh, doesn't come in little bits but comes in swarms likewise the climax comes in swarms too because it is a tragedy 14 brass comes in with an army he tells the captain to greet the danish king and that 14 brass is claiming claudius's promise that they can march freely over the Danish soils, that they have the necessary permission, that by his license they may do the march. If the king wants to meet them, they will meet them. The captain agrees, and they leave. So this is a very short interjection, and it may seem useless, but it mirrors Denmark's situation in the thirst to avenge a father, and it also shows us how different young Fortinbras and young Hamlet are, how different people would have handled the situation. Hamlet is driven to desperation, to overthinking, to an act akin to madness potentially stemming from his inner turmoil. And here is young Fortinbras taking life by its labels and saying, you want something done? You do concrete action and you think about it and you don't rush things. And we'll see how that plays out for young Fortinbras, but we can assume that largely with success. So we can potentially see which approach Shakespeare would side with. Act 4, scene 5. Enter Gertrude and Horatio. So Gertrude refuses to speak to her. We don't know who, who her is yet, and Horatio asks that the queen does, if only out of empathy. Her mood will needs be pitied. Horatio then begins to describe the symptoms, and it is clear that her, that the talk, is of Ophelia. We also see that it is a sharp contrast to Hamlet, because she is genuinely mad, and it comes as a shock to the audience. Horatio says that she talks a lot of her father. She hears there's tricks in the world, and hems, and beats her heart, spurns enviously at straws, speaks things in doubt that carry but have sense. In other words, her speech is muddled and confused. She speaks incoherently, she hears things, she sees things, she gets angry and spiteful at the slightest things, she's there to pick arguments with people, she's much embittered and emotional made by her father's death. She speaks randomly, without much meaning, and then Gertrude hears these symptoms, she says that it is best she is spoken to because she may strew dangerous conjectures in ill-breeding minds. In other words, she may influence those around her, she may prompt dangerous thoughts, and others might be driven to revenge or also to madness. Horatio admits Ophelia after the queen agrees to see her, and Ophelia comes in, remarking aside to herself that, to my sick soul, as sin's true nature is, each toy seems prologue to some great amiss, so full of artless jealousy is guilt. This is an allusion to the end of Act 3, when Hamlet told her that sin begets sin. She remembers this. It's clear she realizes this now, that one bad thing leads to another, and the bad things just spiral. Once a sin has committed, has been committed, more will follow, and it is clear that she feels that she has committed the sin, that somehow she is to blame for her father's death by not accepting Hamlet's love, by prompting Hamlet to do this. And she views this deed as her deed, and this is why she's a sick soul. She views herself as a soul that has been corrupted, both by the sin and by the subsequent madness. Now she's just as bad, and she believes that from here on it will just get worse. And of course, for a young woman to think that already terrible things are going to get even more terrible is horrible, especially for a girl as naive and innocent and as unprepared for the world as girls of the age would have been. It's too much for her mental health. She comes in playing on a lute. Her hair is down. For, um, she's not in control because her hair is down. She's not adequately prepared for court. She's not adequately in control. She's not adequately in control of her facilities and her physical appearance. She's not the fixed and sensible young woman that she was. She's losing it. The songs she sings are ballads. They're love songs of unrequited love and death. And there may be two causes to her madness. Not only Hamlet's death, but Hamlet's rejection of her love. It's a first love, and it was clear that it was very passionate. She loved Hamlet with all her heart. 
she has lost two men at once. What she views as the subsequent act of killing her father could also potentially stem from the loss of that. These are inextricable causes and they compete for her attention. We can't help but ask if she knows that her father has died, if she's allowing herself to process it, or has she lost her grip so much that it is not no longer clear. She's singing these songs to Gertrude, Hamlet's mother, and she doesn't answer any of the queen's questions. She just tells her irritably to Pray you, Mark, listen to me. Is this not a desperate cry to be heard by women everywhere? To listen to her for once, to listen to the causes of the grief, to let her grieve. Even now, no one is listening to her. Even now, thoughts are of Hamlet or of what to do next or about the kingdom or about the wolf. And nobody seems to care about a young girl whose heart has been broken and shattered by the people who have manipulated her, by the people around her. And it, only now that they're willing to help her they're paying attention to her but they're still not listening it's indicative of a woman's position claudius comes in she continues singing she says that we know what we are but know not what we may be one of the most famous lines of the play is muttered by a mind far gone she does not mean anything by it because she seems to be lost from the world yet at the same time there is so much meaning in here that we can't help but feel that Ophelia was just an inherently wise woman who was just inexperienced and even in madness she cuts to the chase. It's applicable here because we know that we are born as humans, born in our positions, but we may always change. We do not know what we may become, what may come of us, much like she feels that even though she was born in a noble standing, her life has suddenly fallen apart. She has become a sinner. Claudius remarks, conceit upon her father. These are all wild fancies caused by her father's death, in other words. Even now, he's thinking about Polonius and about that rather than what to do about poor Ophelia what could have been changed what could have been addressed especially because she has spoken of how the owl was a baker's daughter before she said this so this seems like a random line another sign of insanity but this actually gives us another key to ophelia's mind there's a folk tale where christ goes to a baker and asks for food and the daughter says that they they have given christ too much because she doesn't know that it's christ and he turns her into an owl she views herself as such too that she's being punished for not giving enough to those who are well-meaning to hamlet she's the ungrateful daughter and because of this polonius has died when claudius says this line about her father she re she reacts to it she says pray you let's have no words of this she doesn't work to she doesn't want to talk of this she doesn't want to consider it even she carries on singing and what she sings next is also significant she sings that tomorrow is saint valentine's day so she'd rather not talk of both her father's death and focus on love instead. She grieves for the father's death, she grieves for the loss of a lover. Both are painful, so she switches in between both to not focus on one. She then sings a body ballad about a woman telling her husband, you promised to marry me if we had sex, if we tumbled together. It's rude, it's inappropriate for an innocent, innocent now because, innocent because she views herself as being corrupted now, woman of her standing. It's again symbolic of her loss. Ophelia remarks that she will tell her brother of it. It's unclear exactly what is it, but likely it's her situation. So she bids goodnight to everyone and leaves. Claudius tells Horatio to follow her close, give her good watch, I pray you, and Horatio exits. Yeah, for now she's the priority, while well, everyone has time. We'll see that when things start escalating, she's quickly forgotten, which is why nobody's watching her when she drowns. Claudius remarks that, oh, this is the poison of deep grief. It springs all from her father's death. What they notice now and seek to help is what they learn from Hamlet, except that Hamlet was pretending to be mad when Ophelia isn't, even though both of them are suffering. Hamlet in his suffering has made Ophelia suffer, and now this is what they must deal with because they failed to address it in Hamlet. They failed to allow him to grieve for her hus uh, grieve for his father, and now here is Ophelia grieving for hers. He tells Gertrude that when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions, the line that I was mentioning earlier. This pretty much sums up the concept of tragedy because there is always a sense of calm before the storm and then suddenly everything that goes wrong.
goes wrong. It is also deeply unfair that Claudius is saying this when he was the one that started it. The first sorrow is not Polonius's death, as he claims, but that of old Hamlet, which he has caused. Claudius conveniently ignores this, citing the first cause as her father's slain. Of course, he's eager to shift the attention. Hamlet is now the problem, which means I'm not the problem, which means I am free from sin. That is very much the approach. He then comments on poor Ophelia, divided from herself and her fair judgment without the witch wear pictures of mere beasts. So this is actually, again, a parallel to Hamlet. It's interesting now that we start to see these parallels only once Hamlet has committed a corrupt deed and now that Claudius seems to have taken Hamlet's words to heart. So um, this is a parallel to Hamlet's first, uh, one of his first soliloquies and monologues where he talked about Gertrude and called her a beast which wants discourse of reason would have gone longer. This refers to her marriage that he views it as too soon. And it's another way that we also see parallels between the women in the play. They're both driven to desperation by the grief and sorrow caused by the men in their lives. And Claudius also agrees with Hamlet that the only thing separating humans from animals is reason, which links to the theme of madness which we have discussed throughout. So then a messenger comes in, and the messenger tells him to save yourself, my lord. Even the ocean is not as wild and impetuous than young Laertes in a riotous head, who comes fighting to see Claudius, brandishing his weapons. He also has a group of supporters shouting Laertes should be king instead, and the doors are broken down, and Laertes comes in, telling the followers to leave him. Laertes is instantly coming, as soon as he has heard news of his father's death, to get his revenge. It's another difference to Hamlet, another way of approaching revenge. The people are also clearly supporting Laertes rather than Claudius. Who is Laertes? And nobody really. Claudius is disliked. We have seen evidence of this before where he was fearful to put Hamlet on trial and we can see it now here too. He has done all of this to get the crown, caused so much sorrow, caused so much pain when the people don't even want him. We have previously seen that they like Hamlet, and we also see now that like really anyone else. So Laertes comes in yelling that he will spill his blood and Gertrude tries to restrain him, but Claudius tells her to let him be. Claudius isn't scared. There's such divinity does hedge a king that treason can but peep to what it would. This is ironic and hypocritical since he has killed a king and the divine right certainly did not protect old Hamlet from that. It is also interesting to note that there was a selection of heirs, a system in Denmark where even though yes you had the divine right to rule, it was a family but it was the people who would choose the next one and the court and things like that and so Hamlet was potentially viewed as like always destined to take the throne but too young for now which is why Claudius is there temporarily but yeah he really shouldn't have this divine right of role protecting him because he wasn't actually chosen even though he's of royal blood. Claudius is confident. Perhaps he's also more focused on bluffing to make Laertes less confident. He asks where his father is and Gertrude says that it is not by Claudius that he is dead. Laertes demands to know the reasons. He claims he will not be distracted. To hell allegiance, vows to the blackest devil, conscience and grace to the profoundest pit, I dare damnation. He is basically anti-Hamlet in this speech. He says he doesn't care if he kills the kingdom, even though he's aligned to it and sworn. He'll go to hell, but he doesn't care. He dares to be damned. Pretty much the exact opposite of Hamlet, who was fearful of death in his most famous monologue, to be or not to be. He's uncertain of how he can commit such a crime. Again, we see a difference in approaches. It's interesting the way that Shakespeare highlights these differences to let us see how the different plot lines play out. Perhaps Claude, uh, Hamlet is one extreme of being uncertain and Laertes is the other extreme of being too certain and both of them die and it is young fortune brass that's the solution but it's up to our interpretation to decide who's right. Claudius tells him I am guiltless of your father's death and am most sensibly in grief for it and before Laertes gets a chance to reply Ophelia comes in with flowers in her hair and when he sees her he's incredibly and genuinely distraught. He cared for his sister. Tears seven times sought burn out the sense and virtue of mine eye. In other words, he'd rather be blind than see the sight. He vows that, by heaven, thy madness shall be paid by weight. By weight as an atoned for in full measure. We'll make justice on our side to avenge for my dear maid, kind sister, sweet Ophelia. By weight could also be by weight of blood and flesh. He'll not sleep until he gets his revenge for poor Ophelia and her fa his father. Oh heavens, is it possible young maid's wits should be as mortal as an old man's life? 
Ophelia continues singing, and she begins to give out flowers. Rosemary's for remembrance, pansies for thoughts, fennel and columbines she gives to Gertrude as married and fidelity and cuckoldry. Significant commentary as she basically tells Gertrude that Gertrude has cheated on her husband. Rue she gives to Claudius. Rue as a symbol for, well, rue. Regret. She tells him you must wear your rue with a difference. We both regret things, but you are actually guilty whereas I am innocent. It's an incredibly powerful scene of a young woman saying everything that she wants to say through flowers, through things that she could not express outright. And the tragedy is that even this is lost. For maybe not on the audience, who could have potentially known more about the language of flowers than modern readers, but certainly on the king and the queen and the court. There's a sense that though she's mad, she's talking sense, she's communicating, she's aware, she's through social convention. Again, she shows us that madness was not necessarily madness in the head, but rather someone who doesn't fit into society. Daisies would be symbolic of love. She has just one, she says, and violets, she says, withered when my father died. Violets are also about love, so she's saying that my love died when my father died, as in my love for my father, but it could also be about her love for Hamlet, who she knows killed him. Laertes remarks that thought and affliction, passion, hell itself, she turns to favor and to prettiness. She brings a beauty to the situation through flowers, something pleasant and agreeable, but of course she's also pointing out her thoughts, her feelings of unhappiness. She's turning to songs and flowers to express her unhappiness through happy things. It could be a link to how women were not allowed to feel what they want to feel. Their passions were controlled, and as soon as she says that, see, she sings a tragic song about a man who died, his beard as white as no. This song is very clearly about Polonius, who also died and his beard was white as snow. She begs God to take care of him, have mercy on his soul, and she leaves. Claudius then tells Laertes that think about whom your wisest friends are. He tells him to be patient, and Claudius will tell him who is guilty, and that trust me, I swear, we have no direct or indirect action to do with your father's death, direct or by collateral hand. If they find us involved, we would give our kingdom, crown, life, etc. But for now, please just be patient, and we shall jointly labor with your soul to give it due content. Laertes agrees, showing Claudius is a great manipulator with his calm demeanor. He has managed to calm him down to defuse the situation, the potentially very dangerous situation for Claudius. And I also think that it shows us that Laertes is avenging his father out of duty and revenge for Ophelia, rather than particularly because of a strong bond for his father. He calms down and remarks that he is angry at his obscure burial, the fact that there is no noble right nor formal ostentation. It's horrifying to him that his family members are not going into death prepared, not given the kind of funeral they deserve. Again, this mirrors Hamlet, and the belief of the time that to pass into heaven you need a proper rite of passage, which is also why it was so important for Hamlet to get revenge for his poor old father who was taken away when he was unprepared, and not kill Claudius while well, he's doing something good, like praying. He wanted to kill Claudius when he was sinning and sleeping with Gertrude. That rite is important, and Laertes is angry that that right hasn't been followed. Perhaps it's more of his fear for what awaits his father or his fear of reputation rather than a, like a particular desire to revenge out of filial love. Claudius tells him he will hear of the reason behind this in due time and tell Laertes everything, and where the offenses let the great axe fall. I pray you, go with me. So things are certainly not looking very good for Hamlet at this point because Laertes is sworn on revenge and Claudius is intent on using him. Let the great axe fall. He's happy to let Laertes take revenge into his own hands. He's basically telling him outright, I'm not going to stop you. They exit. Act 4, scene 6. A servant comes in to present Horatio with letters, and sailors come in too. The sailor presents Horatio with a letter from the ambassador that was bound for England, and that is, of course, a letter from Hamlet. This is somewhat of a last-minute turn of events that saves Hamlet from death that he likely would have faced in England. The letter received states that Hamlet's ship was attacked by pirates. Here we were two days old at sea, so not even two days and they were attacked. Claudius' plan, perhaps? And during the battle, Hamlet boarded the ship and promised that he will be the pirates' prisoners if only they deliver him back to Denmark for a handsome reward, of course. I am to do a good turn for them. Hamlet has quickly taken the matter into his own hands and he seems to be a favorite, so he seems to be a favorite with everyone and the pirates let it slide. They were like, nope, even if Claudius paid us, this agreement is better. So Hamlet urges Horatio to let the sailors give another letter to the king and to then go visit 
took Hamlet at once. Repair thou to me with as much speed as thou wouldst fly death, because he has private and important words to tell him, potentially his plan. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern hold their course for England. So basically what happened is Hamlet's ship was attacked by pirates. He let Rosencrantz and Guildenstern go on and he let himself be taken as prisoner. And here he is back in Denmark like he wanted to be. Or... Maybe he didn't want to be, but he developed a new plan and he's happily on board with it now. Horatio leaves following Hamlet's instructions and this very short scene ends. We now move on to the final scene of Act 4. And it's an exchange between King Claudius and Laertes. Claudius tells him to put me in your heart for a friend. In other words, I am most definitely your friend. And we see that this has taken place, that, that this act is, uh, that this scene is taking place right after Claudius has told Laertes that Hamlet killed Polonius. And Laertes seems to have believed that Claudius had nothing to do with Polonius's murder and that it's all Hamlet. And I mean, yes, of course, that's true, but it is surprising that Laertes so quickly accepted it, given that, like, one scene ago, he was marching in, willing to kill the king and to commit regicide and to commit a crime against religion, purely to avenge his father and to avenge his sister. So we do see that Laertes is very, very quick to act, but he is also easily manipulated by someone who knows how to manipulate Claudius, the expert. Uh, he asks, though, suspicious, why Claudius has not done anything about it or challenged Hamlet in any way, and Claudius confesses that he has been hypocritical and that he's scared because Gertrude and the commoners love Hamlet, and he doesn't want to damage his reputation by challenging Hamlet. Laertes says, yes, that makes sense, but he doesn't really care about his own reputation. Who is he? He's just Laertes, so he'll do anything to get his revenge. And so have I, a noble father, lost, a sister driven into desperate terms, because I have lost a father and my sister has gone mad. I will stop at nothing, but my revenge will come. So this one is pretty straightforward. Because I have lost my father and because I have lost my sister, I won't stop at anything. What is reputation to me? It's unimportant. Claudius agrees with him, stating, I loved your father and we love ourselves. He's very eager to prey on Laertes' desperation and emotion, as he could get rid of Hamlet without lifting a finger. He pretends to care more about Polonius than he actually does. So when Polonius died, Claudius did not grieve for him in the slightest, at least openly. He merely saw it as another opportunity and to get back at Hamlet and punish him. A messenger comes in bringing letters from Hamlet. Claudius is obviously shocked. He asks who has brought them. He collects the letters and tells the messenger to leave them. Hamlet is still carrying on with the mad act because he tells Claudius he is set naked on your kingdom and will beg to see your kingly act. He will ask his pardon and tell him why he has returned. He has also adopted a begging tone because he clearly has formulated a new plan. He wants the king to accept him. He pretends to be in a vulnerable state. He will ask his pardon and tell him and Claudius does not understand what this letter means because the words on their own make sense. Like, yeah, he's coming back to ask a pardon, but why? How? All these questions. He does not know if the rest are coming back, if Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, who he has sent off, are coming back. He recognizes Hamlet's hand though. So he asks questions about the letter and by his tone we can tell that he's worried about what this means because just when he thought he got rid of Hamlet once and for all, here is the man alive and well and telling him he wants to see him. Laertes for his part is eager to have Hamlet back to enact his revenge and says that he will not be stopped even by Claudius's rule and Claudius says don't worry I wasn't planning on stopping you, I shall arrange it that you get your revenge and not. I certainly won't try to stop you. He just wants to make sure no one suspects anything. For his death, no wind of blame shall breeze, but even his mother shall uncharge the practice and call it accident. Laertes agrees to let Claudius orchestrate the affair if you could devise it so that I might be the organ. He doesn't care if Claudius is using him. He doesn't care if it's not his plan. He has a pragmatic concern. He wants his revenge and he'll stop at nothing to get it. And that's different from Hamlet who bears in mind the kind of aspects like reputation and prestige, noble standing, perhaps because of his lower standing in court than, well, Obviously, he's not the crown prince of Denmark. Laertes is not too concerned about how people will perceive him or his honor and integrity. He has a goal and he's not stopping at anything to go and get it. And if that means Claudius will play him as an organ, so be it. And then Claudius starts telling Laertes his plan. And essentially, he says that a little birdie, well, more specifically, a Norman called Lamond, told me that you're a good source fighter. He praised Laertes for art and exercise in your defense and for your rapier, most especially. So I 
I heard that you helped out this man. And, well, if you're so good at sword fighting, maybe you can challenge Hamlet. Claudius asked him if his father was dear to him, or are you like the painting of a sorrow, a face without a heart? So he asks him, in other words, what are you willing to do for your father? Are you willing to get in a fight with Hamlet to make sure that you kill him, to compete with Hamlet, who is well known to be a good swordsman? And Claudius and Laertes says, yes, of course. And when Hamlet comes back, what would you undertake to show yourself your father's son in deed more than in words? So are you all bark and no bite? Or are you actually willing to go and fight out against Hamlet and bear the consequences? Because if you kill the crown prince of Denmark in front of the court in a competition as large as this, you're certainly not making it out alive. Are you ready for this? He's goading him. He's prompting him into accepting. And Laertes is happy to take the bait. He replies, to cut his throat in the church. I'm willing to cut his throat in church. I don't care. I can be damned. I, I mean, he's accepting damnation. He's accepting the challenge. He's stopping at nothing. And Claudius agrees that revenge should have no bounds. And this is tragic because previously we have seen that Hamlet wanted to kill Claudius exactly in the church and didn't do it because it's a church. And he believed that revenge should have bounds. And also he wanted a, like a better, like a more violent death for him. He wanted him to die doing something evil. So yeah, he believes that revenge has bounds. Look, he's careful to not not hurt his mother too much, only with words, not with action. And here are these two plotting to kill the crown prince of Denmark, saying that revenge has no bounds. And I mean, what, what, what did we expect? What did Hamlet expect? If Claudius was willing to commit the worst crime and kill his brother, he certainly doesn't think that revenge does have bounds. Laertes claims that he will anoint my sword with poison so that nothing can save the thing from death that is but scratched the doll. In other words, Claudius asks him, well, do we have a backup plan? And Laertes is like, yep, if I don't manage to kill him, just one scratch will be enough because the poison is strong enough that you can die from a scratch. And Claudius agrees with this, but he says that they need a backup plan, again, should have a back or a second that might hold if this should blast in proof. He decides that he will prepare a drink for Hamlet, a chalice for the nonce whereon but sipping if he but chance escape your venom stuck our purpose may hold there. In other words, if somehow you don't manage to scratch Hamlet in your battle, I will make sure to finish off the job by giving him a poisoned cup of tea. Gertrude comes in at this point, and she says, One woe does tread upon another's heel, so fast they follow. Your sister's drowned. Poor Ophelia. This entire act has been just a complete and utter devastation for anyone who felt any inkling of empathy or any sort of human emotion towards poor Ophelia, because this act has been very, very rough from Ophelia's crazy act of the previous scenes to this now, we see that madness swiftly led to her death, something that did not follow in Hamlet's case because he was far more superficial in his approach, whereas she, as the naive and innocent young girl that she was, felt all her emotions genuinely and so death followed not soon after. Laertes asks where she has drowned, and the queen begins to describe a beautiful river, with a willow that grows near it, a clear and perfect glassy stream, where Ophelia came with fantastic garlands, with lots of flowers, and especially long purple ones, aptly but horribly named Dead Man's Fingers. Perhaps you've seen this painting of Ophelia drowning. It's a beautiful painting, and it's a beautiful and romantic description here, well suited to Ophelia. Listen, she fell in the weeping brook. She was found with her clothes wide and mermaid-like, and like a creature unto that element. She's so ethereal, she feels like a water nymph, like she belongs there. Her garments were heavy with their drink. It's such a romantic description, until at some point we realize that Ophelia has died. That even in her death, we're considering her beauty and not realizing the true horrors. And it's as when we realize that at the same point, so does Gertrude. And so she says that heavy with their drink, the clothes pulled her from her melodious lay to muddy death. Because as romantic as it may seem for her to float up here in this bed of flowers, poor Ophelia has died. She's died from grief and madness, and she's left an imprint on all of us. And Laertes says something that for me, was one of the most powerful lines of the play, not specifically in terms of quotes, but in terms of meaning. He says he will not cry because poor Ophelia has drunk too much. She has had too much water already, so he will forbid his tears. And enraged, he leaves, saying, I have a speech of fire. 
th there's just something so powerful about saying I won't cry for my sister because she has drowned and I think it truly shows that their relationship was very genuine and they were very close and it hits poor Laertes hard which is why I really cannot blame Laertes for siding with Claudius or deciding to resort to these dirty measures because he's grieving for his father and he's grieving for Ophelia and his revenge is I feel very very justified just like Hamlet's but the way that he carries it out He's just another pawn that ultimately loses to Claudius's game. Claudius tells Gertrude to follow her and, uh, to, sorry, to follow Laertes and that he tried so hard to calm his rage. Now he will most likely have to start again in trying to calm him. As if Claudius really tried, all Claudius did was incite and provoke more violence. He really is the main driver behind this entire tragedy, which is why I think it's such a shame that he's one of the last to die and throughout this entire play we have seen so many innocents fall at the hands of Claudius and they both leave and so ends act four which was one of the longest it had seven scenes and because of the length it did mean that I had to skip over some of the detail but there was just so much to say on the scene alone just in terms of summarizing and I think it was a very straightforward scene in terms of really pushing forward the narrative of our tragedy so I hope that you enjoyed this video and with the next video we're going to come back to act five that's it the final act and our series is done so thank you so much for watching and staying tuned and I'll see you next week Thank you.